All right, today we are talking about the Han Dynasty in China from 202 BCE to 220 CE. I'm going to break this up into several different uh, areas, and the first of which will be looking at how the Han Dynasty came to power in China. Then we'll look at how they uh, ran Chinese society, some of their characteristics, and then we'll look at uh, why they came to an end in 220 CE. So some background of Chinese history in general. China has a long history. It's probably the longest continuous civilization in human history, um, going back thousands of years. And the way we divide up Chinese history is by looking typically at what are called dynasties. So throughout Chinese history, different families have controlled China, and these families have passed down rule within their families, and we give the, the name of the family as the dynasty. So in this case, the Han dynasty is the Han family ruling China. And so we'll look at other other dynasties. You may be familiar with some, uh, looking at other with the Shang and uh, the Qin. And so we'll look at uh, China through the, the dynastic viewpoint. Philosophies in China, the most common one up to this period of time is a combination co between legalism. Uh, legalism is the philosophy that people left to their own devices will do bad things. So there needs to be a strong, strict government in place to punish people uh, for doing bad things and to prevent them from making the wrong choices. So legalism is the idea that legal codes must be strict to prevent people from doing what they would otherwise uh, do, which would be bad. And then Confucianism, uh, we'll get into more detail later in a, in a longer uh, lecture with what Confucianism really is, but for our purposes today, we just need to know Confucianism is a philosophy based upon uh, people understanding that their role in society is based upon their relationship with other people. So it's about how you rank versus everyone else you meet. So if you're a student, you are inferior to the teacher. Um, if you are a male, you are superior to the female. If you are old, old is superior to young. Uh, wealthy is superior to poor. And so it's, it doesn't, it's not quite as mean spirit as that sounds, but it, it certainly is a way for people to understand where they fit into Chinese society. And so that was supposed to create social harmony because everyone knows where they stand with everyone else. And lastly, throughout Chinese history, we have a history of warfare, state violence, where China as a single country doesn't really begin to emerge um, until late in its history, which is pretty common. There's many regional civilizations within China, different countries within China as a geographic idea and warfare was common throughout it. So people were pretty used to fighting and violence. Important person here, Shi Huangdi. Shi Huangdi was the leader of the country of Qin, Q-I-N, in, in the Chinese uh, pinyin derivative where we learn Chinese through uh, Latin alphabet. The Q is pronounced with a C-H, so this is Qin. The Qin state is where China, Qin, gets its name from today. And Shi Huangdi was the leader of the Qin state. He was the leader of this part of China. And it was during a period of time which for about 250 years, from 475 to 221 BCE, many states, many countries within China were fighting each other. So this period of time is called the Warring States period. No one country was, was uh, more powerful than another. China was in a lot of unrest. But eventually... The Qin state, the, Qin, the country of Qin, takes over all the rest of China. And so the Qin state, the Qin dynasty, is going to rule China. And Shi Huangdi had totalitarian rule. Totalitarian mean total. He controlled the lives of everybody in China. He told them what they could do, where they could work, what they could, what they could, uh, what, rule, what their jobs would be, what the economy would be like, what the trade would be. So it was a, it was a uh, total system. A uh, couple of good things he did. He completed the Great Wall of China, which you can see there in the background. Uh, standardized coinage, which means everybody's using the same kinds of money. And you didn't have to worry about, is the money that you're using in one part of China a different value than another? And so it kind of made the economy work a little more efficiently. And units of measurement for the same reason as coinage. So one unit of distance is going to be the same in Western China as it will be in Eastern China. And one unit of weight will be the same in Southern China as it will be in Northern China. And so he tried to standardize that make it all the same so everybody's on the same page uh on a less less good note he centralized culture which said he made sure that what his idea of what proper culture was prevailed so if you were 
uh, writing poetry or art or music or something that he would disagree with what the government was saying, they would burn those papers, they would burn those books, they would prevent you from putting on that kind of artistic display. So the art was managed by the government. The Qin came to power and they did a few things that set them apart from previous dynasties and are going to set up pretty well into what the Han are going to be like. So the Qin free the peasants. Free peasants means that they have, it's a totalitarian system. We mentioned that just a moment ago. And so people could do certain things and could not do certain things. But for the most part, the peasantry was kind of allowed to do whatever they wanted to do. As long as they were not breaking any any huge rules, they were pretty, pretty clear. A lot of the totalitarian system was in place to prevent other powerful families from rivaling the Qin. And so peasants were doing okay. Taxes were low. Uh, so the Qin did not put a lot of taxes in place on the peasants. So there was not a lot to uh, worry about uh, in, in that regard. The Qin were a nomadic people. They came nomadic, meaning they moved around a lot. So their, their culture was one in which they didn't have a lot of big settlements. They didn't settle into one place for a long period of time. But now they've taken over this big, gigantic country. And they have to come to grips with how do you, as a nomadic people, deal with uh, ruling people like China, where the whole economy and system is based upon settled farming. How do you rule people like that? And so that's going to be a major issue as to how they rule. Uh, they did have advanced technology for the time. They used iron uh, in their tools and weapons, and they had the crossbow, which allowed them to have a military advantage over other groups within China. We don't think of the crossbow today as the height of military technology, but if you are facing people who have uh, spears and swords and you can arm a lot of people with a very crude device that can shoot a crossbow bolt over a distance that will uh, take them out, then you have a pretty big military advantage. And so that's how the Qin were able to uh, maintain rule for a little while. So if we look back at Chinese governance, governance meaning the system of which uh, a place is run, uh, there are two types of rulers in China. And this could probably be true in a lot of world history, but we're going to look at it through the Chinese perspective here. So you have what are called warrior rulers. When you think of like a strong man, somebody who takes over a place, somebody who wins a war and then takes over a country and begins to rule it. That type of person is going to have a way of looking at the world that is mostly going to be I am strong and therefore I get to run the place wherever I want to. And I tell people what to do and they're going to do it. And it's kind of this strong man rule and this, this idea that might makes right, that if I say it, it should happen. And so that's a pretty common way for governments to come into power, right? Because if you're going to have wars that are going to lead to uh, dislocation or a little instability, then people who are going to come out on top are going to be the strongest, the ones who can raise an army, the ones who can fight the best. And so this is one type of ruler. Shi Huangdi, we just mentioned him before, was one of those guys. He, he ran the Qin state. He was a military uh, leader. He was a general. And he, he took over and ran China in that way. The other part of Chinese gov of history of governance is the enlightened ruler, someone who comes to power uh, maybe through um, inheriting the role or by seeking others, people's support. They're not doesn't they, maybe they fought to get it, but it's, it's more of a, a, a philosophy of how they're going to run. They're going to care more about what other people think about what they're doing. And they try to get consensus or agreement about what should be happening. Or they look to tradition. They look to um, what makes most people happy with the situation. They try not to rock the boat too much. And so what we're going to see is we're going to see this pattern take place when the chin uh, change over to the Han. The Han will take over. There's a civil war in China between the Qin family, who was, current, who was ruling China, and then the Han family, which was looking to take over. And so we're going to see two different emperors, Liu Bang and Gao Zhu, and these two guys are going to be in succession, one after the other, um, the leaders of the Han, and they will eventually defeat the Qin, and they will start a dynasty of their own. They're the members of the same family and they will create a dynasty in China that will last 400 years. The good thing for the Han is that Shi Huangdi was not a bad leader. 
So he was able to create the Great Wall of China, so defenses. He was able to militarily protect China, so they have their safe for the time being, able to take over a country that is not being overrun by outside threats. We mentioned the coinage, so the economy is doing good. Shi Huangdi also helped the infrastructure, infrastructure meaning um, the guts of a country. So the roads, the bridges, the ports, um, all that stuff that makes it possible that we don't really think about on a day-to-day basis, like how does anything get done in the country? You can't ship goods if the roads are not good. You cannot offload trade at the at the docks if the ports are in disrepair. So keeping up with those kinds of things takes a lot of work. But the, the Han were very lucky when they came to power and defeated the Qin that they had already put those things into place. The Han spread out um, and took over more areas than even the Qin did. And Han imperialism, imperialism meaning the spreading of your country to other places, the uh, stretching out of your culture or physically taking places over. So Chinese uh, culture spreads to these surrounding areas. So if you look at north of China, there's the Huns. To the northeast is the Koreans. And the southwest and south, you have the Thai and the Vietnamese. So the, the Han begin to take over these areas. And China begins even bigger than it was under the Qin, becoming even more immense. They begin spreading out even more. And so Chinese imperialism under the Han becomes a very important part of what makes that culture special. The Han were also interested in social mobility. Social mobility is the idea that people within a society can move up and down. So in many societies, that is not the case. Many societies where you are born, whether you're poor or rich, is where you're going to die. It's very difficult to leave out of those situations. In China, it was possible through education to rise up in society. They had a series of tests that a person could take, men could take in any case, and if you did well on these tests, you could get a job in government. You could get a job as a scholar, and you could rise up from a lower uh, uh, situation, a low, lower socioeconomic class, up to somewhere approaching the upper middle class or even the upper levels, and you could even become an advisor to a government. And so. The role of merit is important in Han China because if you're good enough to do something and you can display this talent, then that is more important to them than necessarily where you're from or what your background is. That's an important part of what makes good societies um, sustain themselves over a period of time. If all you do is promote the same types of people who are already in the upper classes, then you're not getting new ideas, you're not getting new blood, you're not getting new ways of thinking. And so that's very dangerous because then you be, you don't really understand how the rest of the country uh, sees what's going on in the capital. And so China, uh, under the Han and later on in different dynasties, is going to be able to incorporate new ideas because of the social mobility idea. Diffusion of Han Chinese. Han is the ethnic group that most people in China identify with. When we think of a Chinese person today, we're thinking of a Han Chinese person. That's their ethnic group. China today is a collection of ethnic groups. There are Tibetans, there are Koreans, there are Mongolians, there are uh, Muslims in the uh, far uh, far northwestern parts of uh, Xinjiang. So China is a big country, lots of ethnic groups. But the Han Chinese, that, that kind of typical Chinese uh, ethnic group is going to spread throughout Asia as well. And they're going to go to Japan and Korea and Vietnam and all throughout Southeast Asia. And where they go, they spread their culture. And so many parts of Asia, East Asia especially, are going to be influenced by China. So the Japanese language uh, and uh, alphabet and writing system is going to be influenced very much by Chinese. Korea is very much influenced by China. Vietnam, uh, their religious uh, outlook and, and Buddhism and, Hin- and uh, Confucianism are going to spread throughout Asia because of the diffusion or the spreading of the Han Chinese. Economics in China under the Han. China has always had a strong agricultural background and every year they produce much more food than they have needed to support their population. A large uh, agricultural surplus uh, means that you have lots of people. 
kill lots of people, then you produce more food. So it's a cycle. The more food you produce, the more people you produce, on and on and on. That's why China today is 1.3 billion people because over their history, they've consistently outperformed the agriculture and they've always done well. They also produce crops that are very calorie intensive. When you think of the foods that are produced in East Asia, you think of rice. And rice is able to be farmed twice a season as opposed to things like wheat that can be farmed in the West only once. And so when you're producing twice as much food and rice has a lot more calories in it than wheat does per uh, bushel, then you're producing a lot more energy, a lot more people. And so you're going to have, that's why kind of one, uh, one out of five people in the world today is Chinese. The limited import trade, China was self-sufficient. They did not like to trade that much with the outside world. They liked to, to keep themselves insular. They wanted to protect their society and culture from outside things coming in. They had no problem um, sending things out and sending people out to spread their culture, but they didn't want outside influences coming in to make them different. Um, and the last part, peasant conditions are considered, means that the Han dynasty is concerned. Are the peasants happy? Are they doing well? Are they being well fed? Are they upset about things? And they're considering what do the common people of China think is important? Are they going to rise up against us? So maybe under the best situation, they're thinking, we want to help the poor, we want to help the common people of China. Under the most pessimistic way of thinking about it, we want to keep them just happy enough so they don't try to destroy us and kick us out of power. For the time, the Han had advanced technology. Uh, they used this for economic productivity. So they're constantly changing how they're growing their food, uh, how they're going about agriculture, things like that. They did not use their technology really for military purposes, which if you were to look at um, a couple years, a couple hundred years after this, when we get to like uh, middle ages in Europe, a lot of technology is used in Europe for military purposes, for defensive purposes. That's also true of the Middle Eastern civilizations uh, to the west of China. But in China, because they're so big, uh, they tend to focus on agriculture, wealth, wealth creation. So stuff they could trade and, and make money with. So the horse collar was a way to uh, till and farm more land um, than could previously be done. Farming patterns, which aren't gonna be seen in Europe for another thousand years, are put in place in China. Silk trade is uh, gonna be important because silk will be a secret. No one outside of China will know how, how silk is produced. And so China has a monopoly on that. And Chinese medicine is also prized this time and it produces a lot of wealth for the country. And here's a nice map we can look at how uh, the Han uh, got the goods out of China and traded the red line going from China across the north of India through Persia, Arabia, heading to the west. That's the Silk Road. It's called the Silk Road because silk is produced in China and traded along that route to get to the Mediterranean Sea south of Europe and north of uh, Egypt and North Africa. So that's the Silk Road trade. So caravans of people on, on camels are transporting goods back and forth throughout that Silk Road. And it could take years to go from China all the way to the, to the Mediterranean Sea and back. But this was the life of the traders at the time. And they would move Chinese goods all the way to Europe. So this is an interconnected world. So this is a, a, place, this is a time and place where goods and ideas and technology and people are moving throughout this area and kind of mixing and, and spreading these ideas along. Along with people and ideas and knowledge is also disease. So lots of diseases are going to travel uh, along this route, um, most especially along the blue lines there, which are the sea routes, which connect to uh, major ports. Um, but trade, bubonic plague, will travel from uh, the Middle East and India to Europe and to China, and someone gets it, and now everybody has it. And so we're going to see disease be an important uh, vector as to why the Han are going to collapse. So the end of the Han Dynasty, pardon my uh, temporary glitch there. So the end of the Han Dynasty, the social mobility we talked about um, begins to fade. 
what happens in most societies is that they're big on social mobility until they they get their own people in charge and they don't want to let other people in. It's difficult to maintain a system of social mobility where you are constantly promoting people who are poor, who are not like the ruling class. Um, the ruling class tends to want to keep their own power in place. And so it's important that when that idea goes away, um, to note that the, the new ideas aren't coming in, the new people aren't coming in, and so they don't see the problems coming at the time. Court culture, uh, the court meaning the group of people that surround the emperor of China. So the emperor is a incredibly powerful person in Han China, and he might have had hundreds of people every day whose only job was to make sure that he was comfortable and taken care of. And eventually, these people don't have any concern about running the country all their concern is maintaining their own position within the court, within their relationship with the emperor. And so the emperor might have had dozens of wives and dozens of concubines, and they're all scheming behind the scenes. And there might have been advisors who are scheming to maintain their own power, to get rid of a rival, but they're not focused on the problems that are happening in the, in the different regions. And that gets to the next point, which is warlords begin to emerge throughout China. As the emperor of the Han does not focus on problems, the faraway regions, because China is such a big country, begin to kind of uh, separate from the major part of China. They begin to have their own rulers, warlords, people with their own military forces who are running the show. And so, yeah, the emperor of China is in charge, but not really. It's a warlord who's down the street who's telling people what they need to be doing. So the analogy would be if no one was listening to the president of the United States and then the state of Alaska began to have a warlord who was in charge of it. The state of Hawaii had a warlord, Florida, Maine, Minnesota, and then people who are living in those places are saying, why should I listen to the president in Washington? I have a guy who's down the road who's a lot more powerful who's going to tell me what to do or or I'll get in trouble with him if I don't listen to him. He's close and the president's far away. Who should I listen to? And so as the country begins to break apart a little bit, the emperor is focused on other things and he's not doing what he needs to be doing to take care of those problems. The infrastructure begins to fall apart um, because too much happens at once. So they're not focusing on fixing those roads and those bridges and those ports and making sure that things are running as they should be. And then lastly, there's a series of religious revolts which are going to uh, take place religious um, kind of as being the reason why, the, not really the reason they happen, but the identity of the people who do it. So there's a Taoist. We'll get into what Taoism is later, but for our purposes here, just know that there are social upheavals, religious revolts. Um, the Taoist uh, revolts called the yellow turbans because they wear yellow turbans. That's how they're identified. Um, but they begin to question the society that the Han have produced. And so, so much of this happens at once that the Han eventually cannot kind of keep it all together. And that dynasty will end in 220 uh, in the common era. And so I think if we uh, wrap this up, we can, we can say uh, this, this lecture told you uh, what happened before the Han, what the Han dynasty was like when they were in charge, and a couple of reasons why they eventually collapsed.